Hallelujah. To God be the glory, to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's the author and finisher of my faith, to the third part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit that leads and guides each and every one of his children, to my pastor, Pastor D.R. Lewis, the, the, the under-shepherd of the great old grove flock, <clears throat> and to all of God's children, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Our scripture reading uh, comes from the 16th chapter of Acts, starting at the 25th verse to the 33rd. <clears throat> and it reads this way. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains was, were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakening from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Verse 33, And he took them. The same, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. The grass withers and the flowers are going to fade, but the word of God will last forever. Let us thank the Lord. Our Father, our God, we just come to you as humbly as we know how, with heads bowed and contrite hearts. <clears throat> Not here for any shape, form, or fashion, any glory that's yours, any honor that belongs to you, any praise that's yours too, Lord. But just first and foremost, just to ask for forgiveness for our sins, even the thoughts that crossed our minds since the last time we bowed our head, Lord. So we ask and stand before you right now and ask for forgiveness. Second, we're here to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to call on your holy name. <clears throat> Thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. But Lord, we wouldn't have access to any of that if it wasn't for your darling son, Jesus, who hung blood for, for a wretch like me. But on that third day, he, ha he got up with all power in his hand, Lord. So just thank you once again. Father, but it's preaching time, and we need to hear a word from you. It's discourse and, and chaos all through the world but you're still on the throne, knowing what's all going on. And we constantly asking the people, if you just humble yourself, just humble yourself and call on your holy name, you can straighten it out, Lord. So right now we need to hear a word from you. We lift up our pastor in a special way, give him strength where he's weak. Just touch him right now. Keep your heads around his family. But well, we just thank you right now for the opportunity. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Praise the Lord this morning. Everybody clap your hands and rejoice. For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. If you all agree with this, why don't you join us for praise and worship because the Lord deserves all of the glory and all of the praise.
Good morning, Greater Grove family, and to all of those who are tuned in uh, to us on this day. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, O Lord, again for uh, your blessings. Thank you for extending grace to us to allow us to come back at this place, at this appointed time, to share the good news of the gospel. And Lord, we pray for those that are hearing that they will be able to alleviate their mind from any distractions that would hinder them from, keep them from hearing you on today. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for uh, praise and worship team and uh, for uh, Reverend Ray sharing our sermonic scriptures with us today. Uh, Acts chapter 16 is no uh, stranger to us, and so I, I want to just look at uh, several verses, just, uh, just I just want to remind it, or uh, be, uh, put emphasis on it in our hearing. Uh, verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And the King James says, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was an earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Um, I want to uh, tag this text in our hearing, uh, the power of prayer, uh, the power of prayer. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. This passage of scripture is without a doubt one uh, that stands out among many, especially as it relates to prayer. But I think that there are some, uh, there are some stories that are in it that we see not only on the line, but also between the lines. First of all, it, it is introduced to us in verse 25 with a conjunction. And this conjunction happens to be a contrasting conjunction because it says, but at midnight, which suggests that whatever situation that taken place prior to verse 25 is about to be changed as a result of what's going to happen in verse 25 and the succeeding verses. Midnight itself is a very unique time. It is a time that chronologically has been defined as 12 o'clock a.m. However, we can say without fear of contradiction that you can say that midnight is 12 o'clock at night, but at the same time, it can be said to be 12 o'clock in the morning. Midnight is unique because it is at the end of one era and the beginning of another era. But midnight is not only uh, the time of day or, and or a time of night, but I uh, believe that midnight can also be a condition of life. And uh, you've all heard me say in the past that when midnight becomes a condition of life, then that means that midnight can come at any time. Uh, several uh, issues in, that, that's uh, involving us on a day-to-day -day basis uh, can start off in the noonday, but even the noonday situations can become a midnight. Midnight can be one of those situations where you realize uh, that in the midst of trying to do everything that we've been called to do as Christians, to pray for those that are in authority over us, but yet you've got to deal with a person of the leader of the country who seems to have more interest in the economy than it is for the lives of young children who society say is the future of America, but yet we're willing to risk their health and their well-being all for the sake of 
wanting to have a facade uh, that the country is doing better than it has um, the, in the earlier part of this year, as if the pandemic situation is yesterday's news, that can be midnight. Midnight can be an issue where you have a coworker who's all of a sudden become a bully with a badge and now uh, interacts with a former coworker and when all is said and done, feel that he has the authority to play God by putting his knee on the neck of somebody who he knows but apparently doesn't agree with and then the whole nation is rocked by his actions but yet you still have some who feel uh, that this is something that's supposed to take place because we're in America, that's midnight. Midnight can be a situation on a personal level where you hear about uh, so many people that are dying and are getting sick because of COVID-19. And then you get a phone call about a very faithful and uh, deacon of the church who's now fighting for his life, and then to add insult to injury, he and his daughter is dealing with the same thing and staying and there in the same hospital, that can be midnight. So since midnight has no favoritism, midnight uh, has no respect of person, midnight uh, can show up whenever it gets ready, it, it seems like to me, especially now, uh, that we're in this midnight situation that we ought to want to know what God has to say on how we can handle our own midnight situation. As shared earlier, this text comes uh, to us when Paul and Silas has found themselves in a prison house. They're in a, a prison uh, and, and according to the word of God that their hands and their feet have been shackled in chains and when you look at it a little bit deeper you'll find out that they were placed in what is called the inner prison which is the Bible's way of saying maximum security and most of us know the story we know all about it but I think that it would be wise for us to take a little time to figure out how did they get in this midnight situation in the first place. Well, in order to figure that out, we have to go back to chapter 14. And at the end of chapter 14, we found out that Paul and Barnabas were, uh, were, were, were riding uh, buddies. They would go out and uh, uh, evangelize cities and would uh, develop churches all uh, throughout uh, the region, but for some reason, uh, they decided to part ways. Uh, John Mark, who is the, either the cousin or the nephew of Barnabas, when they were on their first missionary journey, decided that he wanted to go back home when they came to this place called Pamphylia. But, uh, and, and when they got ready to start on the next journey, Paul didn't want him to go, but Barnabas felt like he should have been given another chance. And they parted ways, but uh, God has a way of, of taking lemons and making lemonade because when they departed in separate, several uh, separate directions, it allowed the gospel to be taken to Cyprus through Mark and Barnabas. And then we find the story in chapter 16 where God is going to do a new thing with Paul and Silas. But on their way, they're going to travel to a place called Derby and Lystria. They stop there and they get the assistance of a young upstart by the name of Timotheus or Timothy. Timothy mother was a Jew but his daddy was Greek and so in order to not allow him to be to have any hindrance about his witness because of his uh, pedigree uh, Paul decided to have Timothy baptized and they left Derby and Lystria and made their way to a place called Lystria and Iconium. And on their way from there, they went east and made their way to Phrygia and the region of Galilee. And then watch this, they wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit 
didn't allow him. So, and so we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, that when you're on a journey for the Lord, that you are moved by the Holy Spirit because sometimes the Holy Spirit will not only open doors, but we also have to have some discernment to know when he's closing a door. Because I've heard the seasoned saints say all the time that when he closes one door, he'll open another door. And he opened the, he closed the door in, uh, in, 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 in Asia, but then he opened the door for them to go to Mysia. When they got to Mysia, they wanted to make their way to a place called Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit showed up and detoured their progress. And so they left Bithynia and they made their way to Mysia. When they got to Mysia, they came to a place called Troas, and that gives us an indication of why God sent them there in the first place, because when they got to Troas, according to the word of God, that there Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. What would have happened if Paul would have decided that to ignore the leading and the guidance and the directions of the Holy Spirit and decided to go another way, then he would have missed the opportunity that God has given him uh, and them to go to Macedonia because there's a man there that's saying, come over and help us. And according to the word of God, that they left Troas and made their way to a place called Simothracia. When they left Simothracia, the next day they moved to Neapolis, and from Neapolis they found themselves in a place called Philippi, which is a part of the city of Macedonia. And here is where the story begins to come to fruition because it is his desire to go to Macedonia and help somebody else. But when they get there, they find out that in Macedonia, there's a Roman colony. And a Roman colony suggests that you've got a place called Macedonia, but in Macedonia, this Roman colony is there, and a Roman colony is literally where it's not in Rome, but the Roman law is now the prevailing law of that land. In other words, they show up in Philippi, they show up in Macedonia, and when they get there, they find out that Macedonia is not governed by its own laws, it's governed by the land, by the laws of Rome. Rome does not, uh, Rome is not in Macedonia, but the law of Rome is, uh, uh, is, is prevailing over the citizens of Macedonia. I know you're not feeling me like I need you to feel me, so let me see if I can make it make sense. Rome decides that they're big and bad enough to take over land that belongs to somebody else. And to make sure that everybody knows that the land that they're taking over does not belong to the original occupants of the land, they come in and they allow their law to become uh, prevail over the land that belongs to somebody else. They do it in such a way, and I'll get to it in a minute, but, but, but I think that uh, the Bible reminds us that there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, Macedonia is not the only land in the nation throughout history that has been engulfed by somebody else who take over that, took over that which belonged to them. And the word of God says that while they were in uh, uh, Macedonia and, and they had concluded that the Lord sent them there to preach the gospel regardless of the Roman law, the Roman colony that was there, that was running thing, they were convinced that this is where God wanted them to be. And I think that that's good news, brothers and sisters, because sometimes even in the situation that we find ourselves here in, we, we have to know that we're here because God wants us to be here regardless of what everybody else says or thinks. And then it says that they, that they when they got to uh, there, they, uh, when they got to, uh, 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 to, to Macedonia, then, and, and Troas, and then making their way to this place that they found a church. They found a church, and guess where the church was? The church was not 
in a building, but the church was by the riverside. I'm not making it up. It says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who, made, who we met there. Listen to the word of God. It says uh, to us that, that on the Sabbath day, the day of worship, the day when they would come to meet God, that they found church taking place, but the church that was taking place was not in a temple or a synagogue. It was down by the riverside. Those of us who are distressed about us not being able to meet in our customarily, our custom meeting place, the word of God reminds us of that wherever two or three are gathered, that God would be in the midst. And that's exactly what's happening here in our text. Paul and Silas found a prayer meeting down by the riverside. And then there is some other things in here that I think is worth mentioning. It says that a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Bible said that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And what you've got to understand, the cultural setting at that time, that whenever uh, you had a, a visiting preacher who would come in uh, into a city, the first thing that they would do is find out where the church was. And it was custom for those who was hosting the church to allow him to come and say a word on God's behalf. And it appears that whatever Paul was preaching, it stirred the heart of the people who were there because it said that when the woman heard what Paul had to say, that all of a sudden she wanted to know more about this God that he was preaching about. And I like that, brothers and sisters, because it suggests to us that when preaching is done, that people will, the hearts of people will open up and the word of God can go forth. And then it not only penetrates that heart, but it penetrates the heart of everybody around. Look at the unique setting that this text is suggesting. It said that the leader of that prayer meeting was a woman. And it was a woman who was a seller of purple, which is suggest that she was not just a woman, she was a businesswoman. And you've got to understand the culture setting at that time when women were pretty much set on the back seat of everything. But yet this woman is not only leading the prayer meeting, but she's also a businesswoman. And there's also some other suggestive language in there because the very fact that she was a seller of purple Eating the prayer meeting, it suggests to us that this woman was not a slave. She was a free woman, and she owned a home business. And then when you drop down to verse 15, it says, And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she pers persuaded us. And this is indicative of her wealth. This is indicative of of her, her, her money because she had enough money to have a house that was big enough to invite strangers when they would come by. And unlike the woman in first and second Kings that asked her husband, can she build a house for Elijah when he would come by and he can come to her house? This woman is, is obviously the head of a house because she's not asking anybody permission in order to invite uh, her newfound uh, guest to be a part of her house. And then the, 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 the word of God not only shows us this woman, but then it also shows us another woman, another person in the text. It says in verse 16, now it happened as he went into prayer that a certain slave girl who was possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by her fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but then Paul got enough of her. Paul got annoyed and turned around and rebuked the spirit of divination that was in this young girl. And if you read the text for yourself, you'll find out that the citizens are the Roman mafia of that time, they got upset with her because she became saved. Don't miss what I'm trying to say. The word of God says that as long as they were making money off of her, they didn't mind her being possessed by a devil. But when she got free, 
they had a problem with them. Let me say it just one more time. They, they, they didn't have a problem as long as it benefited them financially and economically. They didn't have a problem uh, with her, with the issues that she had going on in her own life. But once she got free from that, they had a problem with it. And I believe that this is still true today because as long as we're under the control of others who choose to oppress us, they don't have a problem with us. But when we get free, when we got, when we, when we, we when we, when the Lord uh, uh, give us enough sense to be able to think for ourselves and become uh, 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 the, 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 become the people who where we can determine our own destiny, people have a problem with us. That's what happened in Mark chapter 5. Your Bible readers will remember when that man that was called Legion that was injuring himself and cutting and harming himself that nobody had a problem with him. But then it says that when Jesus drove the demons out of him and when they found him, he was in sitting and clothed in his right mind and the text adds a little edit there that said it was when he was closed in his right mind and in the sitting position because the sitting position is the teaching position or a seat or a place or a posture or a position of authority then they got afraid of him and I need to tell us brothers and sisters that they're not afraid of us as long as they can predict and indicate who they are, are, are say to the world who they think we are but when we get educated when we act like we, we've got some sense when we've got some, some, some gumption as the senior saints about ourselves and then they become afraid of us. And this woman, uh, according to the word of God, that they got upset with Paul and Silas because they became a nuisance to the city. And, 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 and then look, look at the wording, how they use it. They say it in verse 20, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. Th these men who are Jews, that th they are troubling our city. And I have at the hunch that every believer in Christ ought to have some nuisance value. E every believer in Christ ought to at some point or another trouble the city. Every believer in Christ ought to not stand back and allow things that are not right to go on and not say anything about it. The Bible says that we ought to be angry against injustice. We ought to be angry against uh, uh, systemic uh, racism. We ought to be angry about things that are ungodly. And then he says, be angry, but don't sin when you do it. And, and you can see in this text, Paul and them did nothing wrong, but they got put in prison. They, they, they did something else. It says that they tore their clothes off and commanded them to be beaten with rods. You got to give me a little time to work on that because you got to understand the history of what that means. It, it's suggesting that they were Jews. But Paul had a dual citizenship. He was both a Jew and he was a Roman citizen. But yet what happened is, is that the Romans had double standards. I know we never heard that kind of stuff before, but they, they had double standards and they would carry rods uh, and the rods that they would use were not to beat other Romans. They were only used to beat those who were not Romans. In other words, they would carry rods to beat those that didn't look like them. And so you, you see here in this text that they took them and they were beaten with rod and then they were whooped with many stripes and then thrown in the prison. So now, let, let, let me paint the picture for you. They, they've been beaten with rods, and they've been whooped with many stripes, and that, that, that suggests that they got wounds that are probably internal from the rods that, from taking beaten, beat, uh, taking beat downs from the rod. And, and then you had external scars that were evidence of them being whipped all night long and so here they are with their broken bodies bleeding and hanging in a prison jail cell at nighttime in a dungeon and the Bible says that rather than complaining and rather than saying woe is me rather than saying why God am I going through this the Bible says at midnight Paul and Silas prayed 
and sing hymns unto God. Now, I know uh, I may have gone too fast, so let me, let me make sure you hear what I'm saying. The Bible says that at midnight that Paul and Silas prayed and sang hymns unto God. Now, I don't know about nobody else, but, but I've been through some midnight situations. And, and, and midnight situation seems to be the kind of situation that would propel even those that don't pray to learn how to pray. But, 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 but the Bible didn't say that they just prayed. I understand the prayer at midnight. But, but it also said that they were singing hymns unto God. That, that they were praying because they were in a midnight situation. They were praying because of what had happened to him them, but the Bible said they not only pray, but they also sung, which says to me, Reverend Ray, that apparently as they were praying, they got the spirit of the Hebrew boss that came to their mind that we going to pray, but while we're praying, we going to celebrate as if God has already answered our prayer. I'm not making it up. It said that they prayed and they sung. You, you remember the Hebrew ball. The Bible says that when they got locked uh, 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 in the fiery furnace and they said to the king, King, uh, don't waste your time. King was talking about we'll give you another chance. Said, no, no, no. We don't need to go through that because the God we serve is able to deliver us. And, and perhaps Paul and Silas had made up in their mind that we're going to pray. And the reason we're going to pray is because we're praying to the one who we know can answer our prayers, so let's praise him while we're praying. They, 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 they prayed and they gave God praise. And, and then they did it in such a way that the prisoners heard them. You've you, you got to see this for yourself. The, the, the Bible said that as they were praying and praising God, that the people heard them. The, the, the prisoners heard them. Then God does something that, 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 that just really blows my mind. It said, suddenly there was an earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. The, the God sent an earthquake. And, and this earthquake, you have to know, was a divine earthquake. I know that it was a divine earthquake because according to the word of God that it didn't tear up everything around it. It, it only, it, it had a specific purpose for a specific time. The first thing that it done, and don't miss this, it said so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but, 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 but we thank God for uh, the movements and the protests and, and the seemingly awareness of what's going on now in terms of our country and the racism and, and the disfranchisement and all that stuff. But, but the real issue is not just us coming to the table. The real issue is that the foundation of these issues need to be uprooted. The foundation, and that's what God is doing here in this text. He's saying that y'all got some You've got some traditional issues that need to be broken up. And, and so the Bible said that he shook the foundation of the prison. And then after that, all of the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. And then watch verse 27. This is how you know God is working at his best. This is how you know that there is power in prayer. Because first of all, it'll shake up some traditional foundation. And I don't have to tell you, you know it more or better than I do, that there are some traditions that need to be investigated. There are some traditional holes that need to be uh, earthquake out. Uh, and then it says that the keeper of the prison, awakening from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But then Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. We are all here. It's amazing that sometimes your oppressors have a problem when you don't use the same weapons on them that they use on you. The, the, the Bible says that Paul says he's about to kill himself. And Paul said, don't do yourself no harm. We're all here. And then it says that he called for a light to show you how dark it is. And, 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 and it says, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I 
do to be saved. And then the, 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 the rest of that is, is really uh, uh, stuff we can shout about because I, 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 I get excited not only because of what Paul says, but what he didn't say. First of all, Paul didn't tell him that, well, uh, you, you've got to learn how to talk in tongues. Uh, Paul didn't tell him uh, uh, that you, you need to buy, uh, uh, you need to subscribe to, to this prayer cloth. You, 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 you need. Now, Paul says, all you've got to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. That, that, that's all required of us is that we've got to just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall be saved. But that's not all. I, I want you to see this. And, and I'm, I'm through for real. It, it, it says uh, that, that, that after that, in verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his household. And then it says, and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. We can go back and forth about what needs to be done in order for the issues that have been in, in play, that have plagued the African Americans and other minorities for years right here in this country. But talk is not enough. Talk needs to be followed by some actions. And, and when we see that this jailer is really repentant of what he's done, the Bible says that he took the same people who he had been beaten, the same people who he had been whipping, and he took them and began to wash their stripes. If America is going to show us how sincere they are about the wrong that has been done, it seems like right now they ought to try washing some of these bruises. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you, Father, that in the midst of our midnight situation, you can still hear and answer prayer. Father, we thank you that you've shown us in your word that sometimes we have to pray and praise at the same time. And in doing so, our prayer becomes a prayer of faith. Lord, we thank you uh, for people who understand that where the situation that we're in, it didn't happen overnight and it will not go away overnight. But at the same time, Father, we believe in our heart uh, that you're still sovereign and you're still in control. And we're praying that you would shake up some foundations, that you would send a holy earthquake so that we can all come together and become on one accord, knowing that we all belong to you. And then, Lord, if there's somebody here who doesn't know you and the pardon of their sin and they're listening uh, by whatever uh, electronic devices that they choose to listen to you, Lord, I pray that they would hear less of me and hear all of you. And then, Lord, help us to be mindful that the best weapon that the believer have has is the power of prayer. It is in the name of Jesus, the only name that matters, all agreed said, amen. With nine hands of remembering. Amen, amen. The power of prayer. Lord, we, uh, we thank our pastor for that powerful message, and, the, and especially in these times. Uh, we can turn to this and turn to that, but a midnight situation will make you turn to prayer. You know, and, and I just love how he just stayed. I couldn't get past it. How he just stayed there for a minute on midnight. Uh, it comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms. And your midnight might not be my midnight. My me midnight might be might not be the next person midnight. But midnight is coming. You know, and Pastor I always say, either you headed to a storm, you in a storm, or you coming out of one. So, so and then and with, on that note, you might be. Uh, on the World Wide Web, thumbing through YouTube, and you trip over on, on this message and realize you in a midnight situation. And you done tried this and tried that. And, in, and, and the pastor touched on it earlier. Uh, give your life to Christ. As, as, as the uh, prison guard said uh, 
what must I do to be saved? And then, and, and Paul didn't leave him right there. Gave him specific instructions what to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so I don't know. But we are, we are in a midnight situation right now with this pandemic. I got a couple of best friends that's in the hospital right now. And we're praying for them diligently. You know, uh, we lift up, we definitely lift up the prayer list every week. But uh, we lift up Brother Mason and his family in a special way. And it might be others uh, that, that you know that I don't know. But I want you to verbally call their names out uh, as we uh, close everything out in prayer. Because the power of prayer. And, and I just love the way he said, uh, your midnight situation will make you pray. But also, it will make you praise the Lord also. You know, say, said, because uh, I know what he's about to do. I'm already praising my God. We thank him for that mighty word. And we pray that he uh, uh, get his strength back and his, and his voice and his, and his, and his uh, strength. Let us thank the Lord right now. Our Father, our God. We come to you as humble as we know how again, with heads bowed, first and foremost, just to say thank you. Father, first, thank you for your powerful word that Pastor Lewis reminds us about the power of prayer. We all on one accord, praying the same thing up to you. There's power in prayer. So let us not be complacent and, and not be reverence of you, you know, too stubborn to bow our heads, too stubborn to get on our knees. Let us continue uh, to reverence you, Lord. But we lift up this prayer list uh, this morning, Lord. I don't know every situation. I don't even know every name. But you do, Lord. Because you're the one that sits high and looks low. Touch in every situation. Touch their bodies, touch their minds, touch their spirit, Lord. Touch their families, Lord. Because midnight situations comes in all shapes and sizes. Maybe someone lost their job at the beginning of the year from this pandemic. Maybe they, they job was struggling just trying to make it to this point. But it's about to go under. And their supervisors and managers have let them know uh, time is running out. That's a midnight situation. Discourse and 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 people are not on one accord at the homes, on the jobs, in the neighborhoods. There's power in prayer, Lord. And only you can fix it. Fix our minds right now, Lord. Regulate our hearts right now, Lord. That we have love for one another. We thank you again for this powerful uh, message. Power in prayer. Father, we lift up the Mason family, Brother Mason and the Mason family in a special way. Touch them out. Keep your heads around them. We pray for the hospital that he's in. We pray for the, each doctor, each nurse, each orderly, each administrator right now, Lord, of all these hospitals right now. Remind them this is not a career. This is not a job. This is a ministry. And the root word in the word ministry is minister, to be a servant. So just touch all, all of them. And, Continue to protect them as they go back to their homes. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you.